Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me on another episode here on Creative Street. Today, joining me, I have Fabiola Alvarez, who is the leader, um, owner, president, and dancer of Breakthrough Dance Company. Breakthrough Dance Company. Um, Hello. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> you want to try that again? <laughs> Yeah. Or you just leave me. <laughs> hey. um, okay. So today we're just gonna kind of get to know Fabiola um a little bit more, Fabi. Um, and you know, she could tell us a little bit more about her experience with not just creativity, because I've known Fabiola like my whole life. Um so I know she's a very creative person, but specifically, I guess, how she uses dance to express herself in, um, and that world. Okay. Um. So before we we get into that nitty gritty part, um, Fabiola, can you go ahead and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your work? Yeah. So my name is Fabiola, as you mentioned, but everyone calls me Fabi. And I've been dancing since I was 11 years old, since I was in middle school. Um, but I've always been a hip hop dancer growing up. Um, I would consider that my forte. And I joined a couple of dance studios, joined my high school's performing arts club, where I also pursued jazz, contemporary. And then when I went to college, I did very intensive ballet training for a few years. So that is a little bit about my dance journey. Right now I'm in Osaka, Japan. Um, I work as a language assistant because I majored in Japanese and dance in college. And so I'm still trying to find ways to connect both of them, both of my passions. So um, the ultimate goal here for me is to use all of the languages that I can speak to make a very accessible dance community, both in Japan and in the US where I'm from. I'm from Miami, by the way, uh, which Stephanie here is too. So <laughs> really exciting to keep connecting back to my hometown wherever I can. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, is this your first time being on a podcast? No, actually, I was on an environmental podcast a couple years ago in my junior year of college. I was interviewing somebody about veganism and we created an episode on environmental impacts of a plant-based diet and the meat industry so not my first time that's awesome yeah like <laughs> you're definitely less nervous than I am <laughs> um all right um uh, so kind of getting into the topic for today right like would you describe yourself as a creative Yes and no. I feel like yes, in the sense that I enjoy how free dance is. Like dance is very subjective. And I don't know too much about drawing specifically like art necessarily. But I know that many of the people that I know that draw, um, just kind of draw the first thing that comes to mind, right? There's no set rules or expectations. But at the same time for dance, when you're creating a project, when you're creating for example, I created my senior thesis in college. Those kinds of things did require structure, planning, and prior preparation. Mm -hmm. So even though I enjoy the flexibility and subjectivity that comes with the discipline like dance, I also describe I would also describe myself as someone who does like to plan, who does like to be given a set structure of expectations and ideas to work off of. So yes and no. I constantly go back and forth, I feel. That's interesting that you mentioned structure and planning um, when we talk about like creativity, because there is a sense of structure and planning, right? Like in almost everything you do. Um, however, you're right. In some mediums, there's more ability to kind of be free form and allow yourself to kind of make that mistake. Um, like you mentioned, when you're creating an ensemble in dance it's a lot harder to free form something um if you're putting on like a show for everybody right yeah. and even then depending like you have to like specify this is a free form like dance um but that it's really interesting that you bring in 
that planning and structure into what it means to be a creative because I do feel like there's like a a sense of a freedom when you're being creative but yeah anyways um <laughs> all right so do you think that that's part of the definition I guess having that freedom to express yourself in whatever shape and form that is um I'm guessing that's part of that definition of creativity and like what it means to be a creative for you, right? Or are there other aspects to it? Is there a different nuance to it? I feel like it's really hard to break away from that definition of a creative being someone who can come up with their own ideas very easily and make do with little expectation or rules set by a third party, basically. Um, So in the context of dance, we would consider creative people as people who can come up with choreography really quickly, who are easily inspired and um, are able to just think of things on the spot. Mm -hmm. That's the definition I kind of grew up on. But the reason why I say I kind of go back and forth is that I've struggled so much with like drawing inspiration from different sources and creating my own work. I've struggled through it when creating my choreography for my dance team or my dance thesis it's almost like a blockage like it's like I feel like I need to have some sort of guidance from something or someone in order to be creative so as a dancer I feel like that's kind of the definition I've set for myself okay all right I I I see what you're I see what you're saying there um okay And would you say that dancing is like your main method of expressing yourself or like, do you do other things like maybe like write or I don't know, um, like you mentioned, you're not a great drawer, (laughs) but like, is there anything else? Because I don't know, to me, creativity is not just being able to do your basics, writing, art, uh, music and dance and all of that. Like, I feel like there's other ways of being creative. Um, are, do you have any other methods like that that you use to express yourself? Totally different um, playing field here, but I would say when I do my interpretation or translating, mm-hmm. when I worked in my internship, um, basically, just to kind of give the listeners some context, I work for a nonprofit in Fukuoka in Japan, and their main goal is to help high school students in Fukuoka God discover study abroad opportunities and um, discover what their future aspirations are, what their future dreams are. And it's not focused on learning English, but it's more like allowing the students the opportunity to use English to express what their future aspirations are. Mm-hmm. And my role um, at this point in time, after working with them as an overseas counselor for about five years in this camp, um, I was upgraded to the role of interpreter. And that meant any kind of language barrier, communication barrier that would come up between overseas people and the Japanese um, counselors and students. I was kind of that communication like bridge, that rope that binds, you know, various cultures. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, I had to listen to other people's ideas, other people's reflections about their own future and their own values. And I felt like I had to grasp that information and translate it into a language that's completely different. And I would consider that being creative myself because I have to find the right words. I have to find the right methods of expressing what this person just said to someone who thinks completely differently. For example, Japanese and English, two very different language, completely different ways of thinking as well and ways of expressing So when a Japanese student would tell me some really deep, interesting thing about what they want to pursue after high school and the overseas counselor sitting there like, what did this person just say? It's almost as if I had to take the words that somebody else said, make it my own, and then be able to translate it for them in a way that this person would understand. So I feel like there's so many different ways to be creative and it doesn't have to come with just drawing pictures or dancing in the way that people think. It's more of like, What can you do with the information that you're given in any job or field, in my opinion? Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love, so 
I love how you use that creativity to be able to and it's like you said it's it's two different ways of thinking all together like we don't realize how different each language like has in terms of world view like in, in every culture like their world view the way that they express themselves it's so we don't even realize it because it's so natural to us um who speak english that you know you this is just how you express yourself but you're right like it's i mean the only thing that i can really go off of is when we're talking about like relationships in spanish and stuff like that and how some words are female versus male and then how that simba <laughs> and how that um kind of influences the way that you relate to not just like yourself but to the things around you to the world around you to you to your family and so Japanese where I can't even comprehend like I may know words because I watch enough anime to pick up on some words but I I don't understand what being in their perspective is right like I can't even fathom the world view all I can do is read books that have been translated into English about it engage an idea yet you have immersed yourself in this language so it's so interesting because you're also hispanic so your your mind must be like in three different it, your mind is constantly being creative with the information that you're receiving um which that to me is fascinating and how you can i i don't know do you ever like compare um like you know uh japanese with spanish and with english and try to see the relationships the similarity similarities and differences of those world views um while you're doing your translation and while you're you can you're still studying japanese because it's not like you can learn japanese overnight <laughs> so um what do you like yeah all the time i feel like i'm comparing them all the time my brain thinks in three languages. It really does. Like when I'm mad, I'm like, my brain switches to Spanish because I just know. And like, I would say, especially with English and Japanese, Japanese, first of all, there's stereotypes that Japanese people are very polite, that their language is very respectful. That I feel like is true, but it also translates into when you're expressing yourself. Like they use a lot of, I think, maybe that's the case. I think this, I think, I think, I think. Whereas in English, it's like you say something and you don't have to say, I think this. You just say it and it's more direct. It feels like a more direct language. Whereas Japanese kind of feels like oh, a little bit more hesitant. And I'm not saying that this is like factual. I'm saying this is my perspective when I compare the two. Mm -hmm. um, my personality changes when I speak Japanese. I become almost like a different person with like different values in a sense and my way of expressing myself and my thoughts also becomes that kind of like shyer I think maybe this is the case I don't know if that's true but maybe this is the case mm -hmm. um and it almost sounds natural like to me as an English speaker and a Spanish speaker two very direct languages that don't require any unspoken communication like you can just mm -hmm. easily find the words to directly express what you're thinking mm -hmm. in Japanese if you're direct like that it can come across as rude or it can even come across as unnatural like mm -hmm. it's very natural to use those like filler words like I think or maybe this is the case um or maybe there's this possibility of something um so it's almost as if like I encourage everyone to learn a completely different language than what you speak because your mind, first of all, it prevents dementia. Literally <laughs> studies come out saying that it's not only the best way to offset dementia by at least five years, but it's also really good for your brain. Like your brain is literally expanding. It's literally becoming more culturally sensitive, culturally aware, and you become more curious. I feel like that's something that people don't really talk about. Creative people are curious, right? Mm -hmm. And like, there's nothing more creative than learning a language, in my opinion. Um, I know we kind of jumped away from dance really quickly, but like, it still is relevant. Well, no, dance. Japanese <laughs> is one of your passions. You, you said it <laughs> earlier, right? You're finding a way to bridge 
the Japanese English world with your passion for dance. And this is all, like you mentioned, this is all creative. Learning another language, your brain has to be really creative, really like, you know, um, fluid. That I, I, I see where you're saying where sometimes in dance, it goes back to this uh, planning and the structure and final, and like kind of this rig, uh, rigidness, the rigidity. I could have said that wrong. I'm sorry. But um, I see what you're saying, right? And creativity, it requires that freedom, the fluidness to be able to do things and definitely learning a new language um, or even getting better in your own language requires some sort of fluidness, right? Like if you're, if you're learning, like, I don't know, for me in, in Spanish, when I try to learn new words, I try to find different ways that I can integrate those new words. Because if not, your vocabulary, your vernacular never grows, right? Just like when you're growing up and you're in school and you're learning new words, you you have to be fluid so that you can use these new words. In your case, it's just a whole nother language. It's not just words now. It's a whole nother way of structuring words, structuring sentences. Um, and I love... I, uh, I want to go back really quick because you mentioned that you know that when you're angry, you go into Spanish, right? And, you know, if you want to be more direct, you you probably jump into English. And if you're feeling that shy and feeling, you know, being more open with, with, uh, with saying things like, I think, and like, maybe, and like, I'm not sure, right? Like, you probably jump into Japanese, right? And how you express yourself in, in Japanese. And it's very interesting when we tie emotions into our language because we don't it we don't even realize how much these emotions are ingrained in our language and the like our personality is ingrained in this language, how you express yourself, how you view the world and how you view yourself is expressed in the language that you use. That's why I think uh, a lot of my therapist friends, they always say like, be careful. And there, there's a very, um, there is this really beautiful saying that I don't know if it's actually Japanese or if it's Chinese, but it's like, you don't want to speak bad about yourself out loud because your inner self can hear you. And it's about that reflection, how words are powerful and they, they mean something. And so you're, you don't realize how much words really can define how you express and live your life. Um, so that was, thank you. Like that was an amazing insight, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> no, I was going to say like, is, is it okay? Do you want to move on to the next question? No, 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 or... go, go for it. Let, I love the, I love this topic right now. I just didn't know how to find a cool transition or like, you know, yeah. I, I get into my rants and it's just like, it's, it's hard to kind of find fluidness and trying to be a little bit more creative with this. Oh girl, um, I'm a language major. So once you get me started, there's no stopping. Like, <laughs> uh -huh. I was just going to say like, you had me really thinking about tying emotions into language because I had been, I see that this is like something that maybe we'll touch into about, does it ever feel like a drag, right? Um, I was just thinking about this the other day, how maybe it's just the fact that I've been immersed for so long. I've been studying Japanese for about five years. So I'm not a beginner by any means, but I do, it's kind of like an upside down triangle. The more you become an expert, this is a psychological concept. The more you become an expert at something, the more you doubt yourself, which mm -hmm. doubt can be very important, but it can also be very detrimental to your growth. You have to believe in yourself while accepting the fact that you don't know everything, right? Mm -hmm. You have to continue to be curious as creative, as a creative person. And I kind of felt like I've hit a plateau, right? Because I've been studying for so long, the triangle is getting wider and wider. Mm -hmm. And I sense that I don't feel like I'm getting better. I'm doubting myself. I'm starting to experience cultural things that um, might feel like a drag to me, right? And one of those things is how indirect the Japanese language is. As I interact with Japanese people, I notice that some of them are very indirect and require you to kind of like 
we say read the room in English. They say read the air in Japanese. It's called kuki o yomu. It's like read the air, basically. And if you're not good at that, then it's really hard to kind of like integrate well into Japanese work environments and society in general. So it's just one of those things where I'm like, oh, I feel like I wish that I could find the words to express this very directly in Japanese without, you know, being offensive or coming off as rude. I just, we we have biases too. I'm discovering like the languages that we speak, they formulate these biases that we have. And I'm like, oh, I wish that Japanese people can be as direct as, you know, people in my country. Or we start mm -hmm. to form these like cultural biases and or they start to come to light really the biases mm -hmm. that we always had so like it just made me think about like how frustrated I have felt lately with expressing myself in a language that I have worked so hard to try to get better at mm -hmm. so I just wanted to say that like yeah it's very important to recognize the ways in which like you can also feel like frustrated or down or it feels like a drag to like you don't want to create kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's so interesting. Read the room versus read the air. It's like, and I, I think this go this ties into the Japanese culture being very spiritual and like very like in tune with the world around it, right? Like read the room. It's like you're thinking of like this specific location but they're saying read the air the air is everywhere right so you it's, it's kind of like this idea that like you're reading the energy you're reading and th this could be my bias from just like my only exposure to Japanese stuff is, is oh you're right there's there's many words that we use in English that they don't have that way of expressing uh, they don't have a, a an expression for that they don't have a word for that a phrase for that which also opens doors to a whole lot of other cultural nuances and like different things like the U.S. versus Japan in terms of like the dialect of English we speak in the U.S. we have these words and expressions that are shaped by our culture and shaped by everyday things and because there's no phrase for those things in Japanese I find myself like oh my god I cannot express what I'm thinking right now because there's no word for this or mm -hmm. I feel like this is not a natural way of expressing things and you're so right like many people despite Japanese people not being very religious in terms of the average person there's still this idea that you have to respect the world around you like Shintoism right mm -hmm. like you know don't slam that door you know be nice to that door that door didn't do anything to you mm -hmm. that's the mentality that lots of Japanese people have like everything is kind of everywhere everything is a representation of something greater which I think is ties very nicely into like Shinto, um, mm -hmm. Shinto. No. And like, I mean, but that also that leads back into this idea that it then defines how you relate to the world around you. Right. So like you may not be spiritual, but the way that you relate to the world is natural and more, more open, more soft, more sensitive. Right you're you're think three times before killing a bug right rather than when you're in this type of culture where it's like go go and I feel like English at least the United States or maybe it might just be my experience but like I feel like it it can be very harsh because of that directness it's very harsh and then that trickles into your relationship sometimes you offend people that you love and you care for just because you're trying to express yourself and you don't mean to hurt them but that's just it's how our language is structured it's how you have learned to relate to the world and relate to others and so I like part of me likes that you're saying that it has it's restricted in the sense that it's harder to be yourself and more direct if you've grown up with this language as your first language but if you grow up with Japanese as your first language you're not looking for these harsh words because you're naturally this sensitive person do you get me and so in English you express yourself in a more sensitive way and you're relating to others in a in a different way 
right? Which that's why I feel like sometimes like when you meet somebody that's not from your culture, you can immediately pick it up because they're not expressing themselves in the way that you're so used to, right? Oh, Lord. Um. So anyways, so it's, it's fascinating to be able to see these different um, relationships of language with, like, between Japanese language and English. Um, and I can only imagine, like, and we haven't even touched in, like, Spanish, all the differences there. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so... I mean, one of the questions I typically ask my guests is how does being creative help you on your day to day and how do you incorporate in your daily life? But like you mentioned, you you do this on a daily this and I I think right now your job is a teacher or a teacher's assistant, right? Um for the Japanese for Japanese fourth graders or is it just fourth graders? Yeah, so I teach third to sixth grade elementary school. It goes up to sixth grade in Japan. Mm -hmm. As an assistant teacher, yes. So I mean, that's daily life. You're you're constantly translating from Japanese to English, and and these kids, they're wild. There's so, a story. Of yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean. You already t kind of touched on, does it feel like a drag? Or like, does it feel, is it hard? I, you know, that the way that I phrase that question, I say like a drag, but really it's like, does it ever feel hard, right? Does it ever feel like, do you ever get to that unmotivated mind where you're just like, oh, can I just have my brain rust for a little bit because I'm tired? Because I feel like all creatives feel at some point that burnout where it's just like, I need a break. And no matter how much you love to do something, you need a break. Yeah, I definitely feel that. I, I feel this in two parts. I'm going to talk about dance first. Mm -hmm. I, as I mentioned before, I did a very intensive dance you know training in college and I love it and I I still love it and I still want to dance but I realized that I was kind of denying my motivation to move to Japan I was denying my motivation to continue studying because the truth was I was liking my Japanese classes a little bit more it's not that I didn't enjoy my dance classes. I miss them and I love my dance professors and all my classes and my team as well. But I couldn't deny that, like, if I had taken a job in the U.S., what would have happened to my four years of hard work in Japanese? Mm -hmm. I felt like, what would I do with it? And Japanese is not spoken as much outside of Japan as a language like Chinese is, for example. Mm -hmm. So I thought, how can I pursue both of them, Right. And I, I kept dancing here when I moved to Japan, um, but I realized that maybe I didn't like or want to pursue dance as a career as much as I previously expected. Mm -hmm. Like I had that kind of career shift. You know, in your early 20s, what you want to do with your life changes like every five seconds. And it's changing every five seconds still for me. Like I still want to dance. I still know that I want to do this mm -hmm. and I will. But there's a newfound interest that I was kind of pushing away. I was like, no, I don't really care about this as much. I'm a dancer, dance, 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 dance. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was like, okay, interpret interpreting translation, those things are really fulfilling to me. And it's because my internship, my nonprofit in Fukuoka gave me the opportunity to interpret. I was like, I really want to do this. I felt very fulfilled working in education, being able to be that rope, like I mentioned before, mm -hmm. that binds various cultures. That kind of international work really spoke to me and it really fulfilled me to know that I was communicating 
with people. And when you learn a different language, you're opening yourself up to millions of other people to mm -hmm. talk to. And with that comes the challenges, which answering your question with Japanese, I felt like, oh my God, I will never get this. And I think, I feel like it's very normal to the ups and downs of culture shock, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a roller coaster, basically. Um, after you experience the honeymoon phase, it, you crash down. It's like, you're starting to realize how difficult it is to actually exist in that culture. The honeymoon phase is like tourists. It's like child's play, mm -hmm. you know? Once you crash down, you start to go up again a little bit until you reach cultural adaptation is what it's called. And when you reach that cultural adaptation part, you're like, okay, this is hard, but I'm slowly getting it. It's like slowly going up. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how hard it is, like not just the language barrier, the constant language barrier, but I feel like at my job, I'm expected to know a little bit more like there's, there are new instructors coming in and some of them have no Japanese ability. And so, mm -hmm. so my principles depend on me to kind of like help, the you know, with the, part, with the, yes, with the interpretation part and mm -hmm. my kids, you know, they're kids, they don't know how to speak slowly to you. So mm -hmm. I have, I feel like I have to constantly be tuned in. You know how, like when you're working and you have repetitive tasks at work, mm -hmm. your brain kind of, you're not using your full brain power. It's on, you're on autopilot, basically day to day mm -hmm. life, autopilot nine to five. I feel like I could never doze off. I feel like I'm constantly plugged in into mm -hmm. daily life. And that becomes really exhausting. You feel frustrated. You feel, you know, I can't express myself in this language as much as I really want to. People mm -hmm. don't, want to befriend me for who I am they want to befriend me because I'm a foreigner um they're impressed with my Japanese ability but that's it you know there it's really hard when you're in a homogenous country like Japan I know that that might offend some people but it's true it's a homogenous country it's a monolingual country the English proficiency when compared with the rest of the world the Japanese people have low English proficiency overall mm -hmm. and so if you live here and you don't speak the language really well, it becomes a lot harder to really mm -hmm. connect, to really feel like you're part of society, despite the fact that you pay all the taxes, you pay towards your pension, and you still never feel like you're integrated into society. So that's been the hardest part as someone who has tried really hard and constantly, you know, to assimilate, to be a part of this culture. That's a lot. Sorry. A lot. No, that I mean that's a lot. That's that sounds so intense. I don't want to say draining, energy draining, because that's not that's not fair. I mean, you're it's a whole nother culture. Of course it's gonna it's gonna feel it's gonna make you feel like, oh my god, I gotta constantly be plugged in. But it, it's a lot, right? And like you're over there not by yourself but away from your family away from everything that you've that you have come to to learn and and you know be a part of um and like you mentioned it's you're used to being able to code switch right like here in Miami we code switch all the time we we even came up with the term spanglish for that reason where like, you know, one minute you're listening to hip hop, the next minute you jump to reggaeton, to the next minute you listen to a reggaeton who has Sp Spanish and English speakers. And so your brain is, it feels at least at, at some, to some degree, I don't know, for me, when you're doing that code switching, you have a break from your other self. Because like you said, like every, every language you speak is a version of yourself, right? Um, I said this in my first episode, I'm Hispanic right and no matter how hard I'm gonna try and keep it to English um for for everybody because I feel like that's one of the lingua francas around the world um there's gonna be moments where I'm gonna code switch to Spanish because it's just how it's ingrained in my brain and I'll do my best to translate but I it's hard sometimes to find those translations so I, I understand I can relate trying to express certain things but like for instance like with our religion it's so hard to describe these ideas that we grew up with in English because it, it, it sounds weird it's like it doesn't feel right so 
um and i don't know like getting back to that feeling where when i'm doing that code switching at least it's a break it's a mental break right um but that's because that code switching is natural it's natural for me because i grew up with it i'm bilingual you're bilingual taking on a third and a third that you started much later in your life so it I can only imagine what that culture shock must feel like and very and it must be very overwhelming over there being away from everything you're so used to um but yeah um and I I I just I like (laughs) <laughs> sorry <laughs> I just wanted to say like <laughs> I admire that like I admire that so much like you are an amazing human being uh for those of you that don't know her she is an amazing human being um hilarious jokester and just amazing person um sorry to cut you off oh no I was just gonna say yeah that really spoke to me because uh, my Spanish, of course, way better than my Japanese. I grew up, I didn't just speak Spanish at home. I took Spanish my entire life, e- even in college. I took advanced Japanese and Spanish lit in the same semester on top of my English classes. Don't ever do that. Don't ever You're take crazy. Like- <laughs> and it was so difficult. I graduated with a 3.95 though. So like, what's up? You know, <laughs> I'm alone in my school. But um, as like, as, as you know just explaining as to how that how it felt to come here and experience a culture that's the opposite I will say the opposite of Miami you know where where I'm used to is that it was always so hard to feel secure in my identity because growing up we were told we're gringas you know mm-hmm. we're, we're American we're not Cuban we're not this and then I go to college and it's all white rich kids. And I feel so different from them. I feel Mm -hmm. like I'm not one of them. And I'm like, is this what it means to be American? Which honestly is just like white supremacist ideals. I feel like this idea of like, what does it mean to be American? And that was just kind of like further exacerbated in a way by coming to Japan and realizing that, oh my God, when they picture an American, they picture a white person, like Caucasian. I'm so serious. And Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how real that stereotype was around the world um Mm -hmm. so like of course I want to dismantle that and be like no you know I'm American and we exist in all ethnicities and Mm -hmm. you know we're so diverse that it's hard to pinpoint what an American is you know and I felt like even since working in a Japanese environment I kind of feel like oh my god did my decision to move to Japan is it does it mean I'm not Cuban anymore does it mean like I don't know because I have to constantly represent the U.S., the U.S., the U.S., but the truth is, I don't always feel like, like Cuba, Cuban identity is part of me. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a Cuban household with Cuban relatives, like Cuban parents. I feel like being an American is also is my identity, but being Cuban is also part of my identity. But of course, because I grew up in the U.S., no one ever asked me, "Okay, tell me about Cuban." culture because Mm -hmm. I feel like I can't accurately speak to that because I haven't lived on the island but it's just like this crazy identity crisis like am I betraying my Hispanic culture by deciding to move to a place like Japan and then I wonder why can't I be all of them why can't I be Cuban American in living in Japan you know and speaking all three I feel like instead of it becoming an identity crisis for me I can just embrace all of it and just flex and be like not only can I turn heads at parties when I just come out speaking Japanese (laughs) nobody expects it from people who look like us Mm -hmm. nobody expects us to speak Japanese so not only is it a good you know head turner at a party but at the same time you're like wow look at me I have access to three languages and I can speak Mm -hmm. to millions of people just by being able to speak those languages so like I know we've talked about it being a drag, but it's like worth it in the end, Mm -hmm. you know, like you just got to do those things in life. You got to just pick up and move somewhere else, somewhere far away that you've never been to before. That's what life is about. It's about trying new things. It's a waste of time to be insecure about what to do next in your life, especially when you're young, you know, like. I love that. (laughs) I love that. Yes. I wanted to bring the mood up too because it's like, yeah, it's hard, but there's reward to it too. No, yeah. I mean, and it 
it's like you said it must make you feel like I am the shit like I am so awesome because look you I guess the mentality is like you may not be perfect because you're not like you said you're you're still learning you're still and you acknowledge that I'm better than most but I'm not the greatest and but still like that must feel like you have superpowers like it must make you feel like I am the shit this is awesome and even though it's hard and sometimes it can be energy draining and all of that like I you wouldn't pick to be anywhere else than what you're doing now I I don't know that could be me just you know putting that on you but I don't know I would feel that sense of like I wouldn't want to be anybody else I wouldn't want to be anywhere else and I'm happy that I chose this direction in life um but yeah I oh okay going back to what you're saying right so it's funny that you talk about when you go to college and you're no longer the white girl, right? Because you're absolutely right. In Miami, <laughs> and like whenever we talk to relatives that are from the island, they're like, oh, because you're a green guy, you're a white girl. It's like, no, you have no idea what white people are. <laughs> I, went, I lived in Miami 18 years of my life, my dude. And I drove four hours, no, six hours up to Gainesville. And they were like, what? You're not white. You're not a white girl. You may have white skin, but you're not, you're not an American, right? Like, and I, I, I had that experience where it was like, and that, that imagine like, to me, that was a, show, a culture shock. So I was used to being the white girl. And then you go to a place where you actually see white girls. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I'm not even close to you guys. I'm something unique all on its own. I'm and then not- they ask you, okay, on, on the college asks you, okay, talk about your culture, what it's like to be first generation immigrant of Cuban parents, as if like, I'm qualified to speak on like all Cubans or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you're at home, you're American. And then you go to your school and it's like, tell us about your family's cu- culture and your heritage. And it's like, right. And it's like, <laughs> I didn't even get to grow up there because they came over here so that I could be like you guys. But it turns out I'm not like you and I'm not like them. So what am I? I'm something completely different, completely unique. So I'm figuring it out on my own. Right. And you were in that space and then went to a completely different space. I'm just like, oh, but you are a representative of the United States. It's like, no, but I never was. <laughs> exactly. Like, what is? What are the we US anyway? Exactly. Who are we? <laughs> what, who are we? <laughs> uh, but I think that's and and I like how you said like. I think that's what it's like to be an American, though. We all came, our families all came to this country, uh, unless you're Native American. And yeah, but I feel like everybody else that has come here, even your typical stereotype of white people, they had immigration at some point from another country. Uh, So it's interesting because our identity is tied to this idea of migrating and it just so happens that we're living the first generation but there was somebody in that white person's family that was first generation and had to figure out that identity made the identity whatever it became um so it's just interesting because we're we're just doing it at different eras in time yeah uh (laughs) um oh um so I like to ask right because I you find out interesting things about someone's experience by asking if anybody else in their family 
considers themselves a creative and how that influenced you growing up right um yeah have you had anybody else in your family that considers themselves creatives I would say Diana mm-hmm. as well. um the reason I just have the earliest recollection of Diana always singing mm-hmm. I don't know are we able to just like say the names I yeah sure. so actually uh when she says Diana guys she's talking about Diana Perez we had her on um it's not about us part one and two that came out earlier um in the series uh you can check it out it's one of the earlier episodes I think it's like episode three um for our part two you could also check out her podcast um it's not about me um that's on Spotify and every other place I'll put a show note a, a link to it but that's who Fabiola is referring to when she says Diana it's Diana Perez so Diana I just have this earliest recollection of Diana singing Paramore songs in the car on the way to church and she was always into instruments I always saw her playing something trying something new which I always admired that about her because I'm not going to say she inspired me to pursue dance specifically because I feel like I'm the first dancer but she's my first role model for a creative person for someone who just like when she was interested in something she just picked up and did it Mm -hmm. and I feel like in growing up there was pressure external pressure from other family members to pursue something maybe something that makes a lot of money Mm -hmm. um, but they just disguised it as do something that makes you happy which Mm -hmm. really was code for quotations (laughs) <laughs> yeah do something that makes you happy I'll support you anyway but it has to make money and it has to be something that I can brag about mm-hmm. and of course being a musician unless you're super famous isn't always something that parents can brag about it's like oh if they're not super famous then that musician's a failure you know mm-hmm. I feel like that's the mentality around creative fields is that there's no real career in creative mm-hmm. field um, unless you're like the top top of your of that world whatever that world is that your art your artistic expression your creative expression is worthless um that's another episode I do is talk about value and that's one of the things that I talk with Diana about it's that value but like value to whom right does it have to be valuable monetary and valuable to external people or can doing something creative for creative expression itself be valuable to yourself right and if that finds you inner peace and finds yeah like finds that inner peace in you like is that not valuable like even if it doesn't make me hundreds of thousands of dollars or it makes me famous around the world is that not valuable I feel like this is a whole other conversation but in the ways that the capitalist system has turned our creative into a product to be sold to a customer. It's no longer necessarily about being creative. It's about catering to an audience and Mm -hmm. basing your worth and your ability in that specific creative field on how many artworks did you sell or Mm -hmm. how, you know, in the sense of like K-pop idols, for example, that's the first thing that I can think of. It's like, is it about making music that matters or is it about putting on an image for a specific audience Mm -hmm. and they have high suicide rates for a reason you know k-pop idols Mm -hmm. that immense pressure it's almost like the creative part doesn't even exist anymore we're just catering to an audience Mm -hmm. so that I can go on and on about how the idea of like the dance industry for example has caused a lot of damage for many creatives and almost burnt them out in a sense to where dance only feels like a product to be sold and not an art to be created Mm -hmm. but um going back to you know what your family expects uh versus you know some doing something that'll make you happy versus something that'll make you a lot of money the thing with Diana is that I feel like, sure, everyone was always saying, oh, Deanna's always doing something new or Deanna's always doing this or I don't know what that girl is doing. But I feel like there's a difference. Those people who say things about other people and what trajectory they're on in life, Mm -hmm. like to comment on somebody else's life trajectory, like that makes you a loser, in my opinion, like to, to be judgmental about someone's life trajectory, because it can change so quickly what you want to do 
-hmm. And I never like saw any rules about life. Like this is how my life is supposed to go. And it's supposed to do this. This is that's that societal expectation that isn't even real when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Like I could just drop, I feel like this isn't making any sense, but it made sense in my head earlier when I was like piecing it together. Um, This idea that, you know, you have to pursue something to the very, very end and never change your mind. And it, But the truth is we're human beings and our mind is always changing. Mm-hmm. And it's ridiculous to think that, you know, just because someone is 30 and they're picking up a brand new hobby, that it's too late to pick up said hobby. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just ridiculous. I just remember like her always trying something new. And I feel like other people were making unnecessary unsolicited comments about her trajectory in life and I'm like is it really like anyone else's business but her own you know she wants to do something new and I think that's very admirable actually mm-hmm. I feel like I just outed our whole family or something but it, it's just like re- recollections of just you know things like that like I just the point is I really respect Diana for just being able to pick up and do something new and not really care about what people think about it Mm -hmm. and I think even now like I'm really proud of just the progress that she's made in pursuing those creative things Mm -hmm. okay and like you mentioned like she was your role model so that impacted a lot of the ways that you then related to your artist your creative expression whatever that was um okay Um, hmm. Sorry, guys, I'm reading through some of the questions I typically like to ask, but I feel like we've talked a lot on these different like points, so I don't want to be redundant and ask like the same type of things. Um, but going back to value, right? And going back to how there are some things in dance that now you're just you're no longer using dance to create right but rather to express this to an audience and that can be said for many different um many different forms of expression there is I remember that there is this this stereotype I remember once that you you talked about like this stereotype in dance right and in ballet and how if you weren't this really skinny flat chested um person you you weren't gonna get picked most likely for the role um for a ballet role and how one of I remember when you first like opened breakthrough dance company I asked you what's the vision that you have for breakthrough right and I'll never forget your the way that you articulated and you were so passionate about saying like I want to break down those stereos stereotypes that idea that um you had to look this specific way um and you know you wanted to make it affordable because most dance um most dance centers they don't make that affordable to just anybody like it costs a lot of money to be able to have your child go and do a hobby that they really like, right? As a hobby. Um, And I think that there's a relationship with your parents investing, quote unquote, into their, their child and expecting their child to become one of these grades because that's how they'll be valuable in that field and that's worth the investment otherwise because dance is just a hobby I'm not gonna spend hundreds and thousands of dollars so that they can go to a class so they can enjoy dancing for at least once a week so can you kind of make it a little prettier (laughs) because like that's just a bunch of things that I, I I like I thought of but I'm I, I'm sure you have a different way of expressing all of that in a more concise way. Of the the vision? Of yeah, what the vision, mean. the vision and all of that um, for a breakthrough. Right. So I feel like it's kind of changed a little bit in the sense that 
I'm still figuring out how to navigate a business in Japan. I've been thinking about opening a physical location in Japan in the future. Since COVID started, I feel like I can't plan anything in the future anymore because you never know what could happen. Mm -hmm. But I do want to make it a life goal to open a physical location. And one of the main things that I, and the newly integrated values that I have is using multiple languages and welcoming people from various backgrounds. If I can hire a diverse group of people to deliver services in many different languages, it already makes it more accessible, not just English and Spanish, but of course, Japanese as well. Mm -hmm. So that way I can tie my interest um, into one another and connect them. But going back to the stereotypes of what it's like to not to do ballet and not be that stereotypically, you know, skinny, flat chested person. It's very real. I remember reading this book, this reading that my ballet teacher gave me um, when I was in college and it talked about drug abuse, um, trigger warning, drug abuse for, I'm going to touch a little bit on eating disorders and drug abuse in this next part. Um, so skip over it if that makes you uncomfortable. But these dancers who dance for the American Ballet Theater in New York were abusing cocaine and other very hard drugs in order to do things like curb their appetites so they're not hungry um, and, and stay really stick thin. And of course, dancers are athletes, right? Um, so the law, the intensive physical strain and the intense physical, you know, endurance that it requires is something that you cannot neglect in any way you need to take care of yourself you need to get your sleep and you need to feed yourself mm -hmm. and one of the things that I found myself falling into growing up in dance is obsession with how my body looks and mm -hmm. I struggle I still struggle with it of pursuing dance as a career because the industry does not make me happy but in order to pursue something that I want to do, I have to do it on my own terms. So if I open my own studio, I'm going to pursue dance and view dance as, uh, let me rephrase that. When I open my studio, I want it to be on my terms. I want to create this safe environment where people can feel like they can look however they want they can dress however they want and they can dance freely without worrying about being the best mm -hmm. and there's a lot of aspects of the dance world that there's a lot of ex societal expectations and explanation <sighs> I'm sorry I'm so sorry I'm like getting a little bit mixed up but there's a lot of societal pressure and expectations for dancers not just how their body looks but you know, this constant hunger for being number one and always winning first place, which leads to perfectionism and tearing yourself down, especially if you're a woman in the dance world. So one of the things that I want to do with the studio is break down those stereotypes, those expectations. I want to do dance. I want to pursue dance on my terms and I want to create my own set of rules so that everyone feels like it's a safe space. And it's kind of straying away from the traditional, you have to look a certain way. You have to, you know, adhere to these specific expectations that society has placed on dancers. And instead, I want it to be something that inspires creative people rather than make them just fulfill these expectations and dance for external validation versus where it's supposed to come from, which is your heart. Which, mm -hmm. which is inside, which sounds really cliche, but I feel like we really have, as dancers, lost that ability. I'm going to cite something that um, is, it stuck with me. When I was in high school, I went to this studio in Miami, mm -hmm. and the teacher, I was with um, my former dance teachers, and the teacher, she, she did something so interesting. I've never seen a dance teacher do this before. She got so mad when we would look at the mirror. Like she was like, don't look at the mirror. Stop looking at the mirror. You look fine. Stop looking at the mirror. You look fine. And I've never had a dance teacher like do that. I've always grown up in studios where like everyone's obsessed with looking at themselves in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Those mirrors cause a whole bunch of body dysmorphia. 
I'm with this this lady. She owns a very it's called Showstopper Dance Studio in Miami. It's very famous. And her teaching philosophy, it stuck with me. I was like, why did she yell at us so much for looking at the mirror? She only let us use the mirror when we were first learning the choreography so that we can see our placement because you have to see where your body is placed. And then she would like close the curtain and like not even let us, or even if she caught us glancing at it after we learned the choreography, she was like, stop, stop doing that. And I realized now many years later, as she was trying to make us feel the movement rather than performing for an audience, this lady didn't even allow filming in her class. You cannot film those, that choreography because when you film the choreography, you're performing it for some sort of external validation. And she mm -hmm. was trying to bring that back to our own self-image and validation. It's like, as long as I feel the movement, as long as I feel good doing this, and as long as I feel like I look good doing it, then I do look good doing it. And it's not you know, based on others' opinions, which performing, I love performing. I love performing for an audience. I love entertaining, but I feel like I love how she managed to center our inner selves when we dance. Like she managed to like bring that mentality, you know, direct it back towards ourselves in terms of, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we even dancing in the first place? It's to feel it. And I, I didn't look at the mirror the rest of the class because I was like, first of all, I was scared that she was going to yell at me. But second of all, <laughs> like I realized the way that I look has nothing to do with my artistic expression in dance. I hope that made sense. I feel like I went on and on, but. <laughs> no, that made sense. And I like, I like that anecdote, right? Because it gives you perspective. It gives you perspective on how, and how different people that with are within that industry um are approaching these similar topics that you you're picking up on right um like she may not be able to make a giant change in the industry as a big thing but she impacted you she impacted your classmates and helped them kind of get back to this place where dancing is fun dancing isn't about what other people are seeing it's about how you feel it's about the movements you're making it's about the ensemble you're creating with the people around you it's not about how you're going to look to everybody else and I think even if you can't do that in a grand scale right like everybody wants to do something in a grand scale to get something to be in a grand scale, it takes little steps and little things, little impacts here and there, right? Um, and that's what she's been doing. She influenced you. She helped you kind of, and it, it stuck with you. So it made an impact for you to kind of reflect on one day and even years later where it's still it's bringing you back to that center of like, I don't dance for others. I dance for myself. And I think that's powerful. That's a very powerful message. It's a very powerful feeling. Um, and I think that also, and stop me if I'm wrong. I think that also helped having a healthy relationship with your dance passion, where you were able to kind of say, you know what? I love dance but this is not, I don't want to pursue dance in, in this way. I want to pursue my other passion for right now while I find a way to express my passion for dance in the way that feels right for me. That's a healthy relationship with your creative expression, right? Because anybody else would say, well, if I love dance, then that means I have to abide by all these rules. Otherwise, I can't be part of this industry. And it it can it sucks to say, but I feel like there are many artists, creatives that fall into that type of niche, right? Like even within music, even within art, like if you don't use or do something in a specific way that the current industry is doing, then your your want to continue pursuing it is not as valued. It's not gonna be noticed. It's gonna be if anything, like 
undervalued, right? Like, un- like not appreciated. I have to say, I, I heard something the other day and I'm trying to apply it to all areas of my life because I'm, I worry a lot about things that haven't even happened yet, might not even happen. Mm-hmm. And I realized I had stepped away that I, you know, this year I kind of stepped away from dance for a little bit. I'm I'm still stretching. I still feel like I'm getting more flexible and things like that. I haven't let go of my habits, mm-hmm. but I stepped away from the studio because I realized I have a toxic relationship with the dance studio. Um, and this is the first time I'm admitting it out loud, but I do. I there's reasons why I'm obsessed with the way that my body looks, where I hear I hear my I see my classmates and first of all, how rich they are and how privileged they are to be able to do such a discipline but I never had a lot of dance friends because I felt like I couldn't relate to the everyday people that were in the industry around me Mm -hmm. and I thought that I needed to rethink my passion for it um I still think about this lady yelling at me to stop looking at the mirror and she was the only she's still the only dance teacher to this day that over a hundred times in like the 90 minute class she was like stop looking at the mirror you look great stop looking at the mirror you look great she just kept like saying that over and over and over. And like, of course, you know, you start to repeat things, you know, mm-hmm. if you repeat it enough times, you start to believe it. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like I had to step away from the studio for a little bit. I had to recenter myself because in order to solve a problem or to address the situation, I feel like you have to walk away from it for mm-hmm. a little bit. You yeah, have to take some perspective. Take a step back so you can see it from a different point of view. You have to ignore it. I feel like it's not just um, your career that that piece of advice could be applied to. It's anything. Relationships, friendships, yourself even. Issues with yourself. You just step away for a moment and then it'll come to you. Um, the, The problem solving method. And I feel like this break from dance has kind of made me rethink just like what my what I want my relationship with dance to be like Mm -hmm. and though the main goal hasn't really changed my approach has you know in the sense of like oh I when I grew up I was like I want to be a tv star like I want to you know dance as much as possible and then growing up now and being as old as I am now I'm thinking I want to pursue it in a different way Mm -hmm. I want to pursue it in a way that's going to make people happy that's not centered around you know catering to the public but more so centered around making sure that creative performers like find their inner passion for dance Mm -hmm. and I think that's more important to me than meeting some societal expectation beautifully stated that is a beautiful way to encompass this idea of creativity and what's the value right um like i mentioned earlier it's a weird relationship that we have with our creative mediums right like as as a creative myself it's a weird relationship because you want your when you create something you also create it i create okay let me speak for myself When I create something, I create it out of the vision in my head, but understanding that others will see it, right? So, and because I know others will see it, I want them to be able to feel and see what it is that I'm seeing, whatever the the medium is, right? Like I want them to be able to feel what it is I'm feeling. It's my way of being able to communicate and connect with my fellow creatives and my fellow humans and so when you talk about what is valuable and what is meaningful and what makes you happy as a creative it should never be again this is from my perspective it should never be something that you're creating with the thought of I need to sell this or this is a this is going to be something that the audience, like it's not catered for the audience. Do you get me? Like it, 
you're making this for yourself. And yes, an audience will see it, but really, it, as long as it's valuable to you, as long as you're able to get that emotion out and get that that feeling across, there's nine, there's eight billion, nine billion, almost nine billion people out there in the world. It's gonna resonate with somebody. The important part is, does it resonate with you? Does it make you happy? Forget about everybody else. Somebody is bound to like it. But does it make you happy? Does it fulfill some something in you? And I think that's a very... It's a very admirable thing, right? Where you want to take dance from being this thing where you're performing for an audience to... I want to remake this so people have a healthier, more um, more positive relationship with dance. And regardless of the money and the stereotypes that go into that industry, you want somebody to feel connected to those movements, connected to the experience of dancing and make them feel happy, right? make them feel the way you feel when you dance and how you're freed and like you know it it gives you some sort of that sense that sense of creating um definitely so fabiola i know that it's super late over there in japan (laughs) um and I do have to wrap this up. Um, so, but before before we close out this, at which I imagine is our first, not our last um, session, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Any message, any information or anything like that um, for our listeners? I will say, don't let anybody tell you what it means to be creative you can as a creative person you can make that definition for yourself you have the permission to be to have that definition for yourself and being creative is not necessarily something as simple as creating something that you know putting something that comes out of your head into real life but more so of what you do with the information that you receive on a daily basis and it doesn't mean that to be a creative person you have to draw pictures or sing or dance Mm -hmm. like people think it is Mm -hmm. it's more about your reaction to everything to the world around you and your biases and recognizing those as well so just define creativity for yourself like Mm -hmm. you are creative I feel like we all have the capacity to be creative just make sure that you're happy with that definition of creative that you create for yourself Mm-hmm. okay thank you and yes that very inspiring I love that <laughs> I love it you soar to get it I love it um, <laughs> all right Fabs where can the listeners find you where can they follow you if they want to um I I know you used to do zoom dances I don't know if that's something that you still do um but go ahead give them all the info for breakthrough dance company Yes, so you can find my company on Instagram, Breakthrough Dance Co. So should I spell it out? I'm not sure. No, it's <laughs> fine. I'll I'll add it to the show notes. <laughs> so Breakthrough Dance Co. on Instagram, Breakthrough Dance Company on Facebook. The Facebook is a little inactive, but I still check it. So definitely send me a message if you're interested in learning a little bit more about what I do. And you can find me personally on LinkedIn. I'm actually very active on LinkedIn. So if you want to reach me directly, you can find me Fabiola Alvarez on LinkedIn. And we can have a chat through there if you're interested in reaching out to me directly. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you, Fabiola, for joining me. Uh, This is fun. And this is a very insightful, very meaningful and valuable conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, That being said. (laughs) that being said have an awesome rest of your day everyone stay creative